and grow from strength to strength. I call upon Dr. Zakir A. Naik to address the subject of Islamic dietary laws and what is the scientific basis. Janab Zakir A. Naik. Tashif Lai. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حرمت عليكم الميتة والدم ورحم الكنزير وما أهل لي غير الله به بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لصدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه كولي My dear brother in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic for today's pre Kutbah talk is the scientific reasons for the dietary laws in Islam. According to the Islamic law, few foods have been encouraged, few foods have been prohibited, while the remaining have been made permissible to all of us. It's not possible to go into the minute details of the complete Islamic dietary law. I will be just briefing you on the highlights of few of the points. There is one verse in the Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 69, which says, From the belly of the bee, you get a liquid of varying colors in which that is healing for the mankind. Science recently, just a couple of centuries ago, discovered that the honey we have is obtained from the belly of the bee. This scientific fact was mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. The Quran says, the honey you get from the belly of the bee in which there is healing for the mankind. If a man is suffering from an allergy of a particular plant and if you give him honey which is produced from that particular plant that man starts developing resistance. Besides several medical benefits and high nutritive value in the honey it has got mild antiseptic property. That's the reason that the Russian soldiers during World War II, applied honey to cover up the wounds. This prevented the evaporation of the moisture and left very little scar tissue. And due to the density of the honey, bacteria and fungus cannot grow. It was 600 years after the revelation of the Quran that Ibn Nafis described the blood circulation. And 400 years later, William Harvey made it known to the Western world that the food we eat enters the stomach and then the intestine. The food constituents are absorbed into the blood circulation, which is transported to all the different organs of the body, including the mammary glands, which produce the milk. This is described in a nutshell in one of the verses of the Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, which says, Verily, in the cattle there is a lesson for you. We give you a drink from within the bodies, which comes from the conjunction of the constituents of the intestine and blood, milk which is pure and pleasant to drink. This verse describes the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell and says the milk is pure and pleasant to drink. <coughs> Today, by the help of science, we have come to know that the milk has got very high nutritive values and it's a very good diet. And it is very rich in protein. Besides talking about the cattle milk, Quran also speaks about the breast milk, that for the infant, the best 
is the breast milk. And today's research tells us that the breast milk is far superior to the top milk for the infant. It has got no germs. It has got no bacteria. There are less chances of the infant having diarrhea or any other disease. He acquires immunity. He acquires antibodies from the mother. Besides it benefiting the infant, it is also good for the mother. Because science tells us that any woman who breastfeeds, she has less chances of having cancer of the breast. The Quran also says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, that verily we have given you an instructive sign in the cattle. We give you a drink from within the bodies, and of the meat you can eat. Quran says, the meat of the cattle you can have. Similar thing is also mentioned in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, that you can have the meat of the herbivorous animals, that is the cattle. Now certain non-Muslims will tell that you Muslim, you all are ruthless people. You are merciless people. Why do you have to kill the animals for food? It is better to be a vegetarian. Let's analyze scientifically whether having non-veg is good or bad. If you notice the set of teeth of the herbivorous animal, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they all have got flat teeth. If you notice the set of teeth of the carnivorous animal, the tiger, the leopard, the lion, they have got pointed teeth, they have got canine teeth. If you analyze the set of teeth of the human beings, they have got pointed teeth as well as flat teeth. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us only to have vegetables, why did He also give us pointed teeth? It means we can also have veg as well as non-veg. The lion, however much hungry he is, the lion, the tiger, the leopard, it will never touch grass. The cow, the sheep, the goat, however much hungry they are, they will never touch non-veg. Even if you throw, even if you force down the throat of a cow non-veg, it will not be able to digest it because its digestive system can only digest vegetables. Similarly, the lion cannot digest vegetables. The digestive system of the human beings can digest both veg as well as non-veg. But still, the Hindu and the Jain will tell you, you are ruthless people. If you read the Hindu scriptures, the sages, the saints and the sons, they ate meat. They also ate beef. So why can't you have? If you read the Ayodhya Khandam, chapter number 20, as well as in chapter number 26 and 94, it says, when Ram was sent for Banwas, he said, I will have to sacrifice my tasty meat dishes. But natural, if he had to sacrifice his tasty meat dishes, that means he had meat. So when Ram can have meat, why can't you Hindus have meat? But this philosophy came into existence because many of the Hindus were getting attracted towards ahimsa, that's non-violence. So to prevent them from converting to other faiths, Hinduism also accepted ahimsa. And they said, no killing living creatures. That's the reason you should not kill animals, but only have vegetables. But now, science has advanced, and we know that even plants are living creatures. So how come the Hindus are having vegetables? Then the philosophy changed. They said, see, we agree. The plants are living creatures, but the plants can't feel pain. Therefore, eating vegetables is a lesser crime as compared to non veg Science has further developed, and today we come to know that plants can too feel pain. Though the nervous system is ill-developed, but even the plants can feel pain. We can't hear it. So, the whole logic has been proved false. There was a person who had 
a very long discussion with me regarding wedge and non-wedge. And he said that, see brother, the plants have got about two to three senses. The animals, they have got five senses. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser crime. For the sake of argument, we agree with him that the plants have got three senses and the animal has got five senses. I pose a question to him. Let's suppose your brother, if he's born blind and deaf, he can't see and he can't hear. And if he grows up, if a criminal comes and kills him, will you go to the judge and tell him that, oh my lord, oh my judge, please give the criminal less punishment because my brother could not see and hear. In fact, you'll tell the judge that you should give him a bigger punishment. Usne masum ko mara hua hai. He has killed an innocent person. If he wanted, he could have tried and killed me. Maybe I would have given a tough fight. So the logic does not work here. Quran says, of the meat of the cattle, you can eat. Further on, some people may say that you Muslim, you are ferocious people. You are violent people. Because you have non veg you start behaving like the animals. You are violent and you are terrorist. I agree with the brother that whatever food you have, it has an effect on your behavior. But we should also remember that our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah be pleased with him, may peace be upon him, he said that forbidden for food are all carnivorous animals. All animals that have canine teeth and claws, including the cat family, the rats, etc., and the birds which have got claws, all these are prohibited. The only one which is halal are the herbivorous animal. So I do agree with you that if you have lion and tiger, you start behaving violent and ferocious. But we Muslims, we have goat, cow, sheep. We are as peaceful as the cow, the goat, and the sheep. If you read the Quran, it is mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 96, that lawful for you is the pursuit of water games, and the food is lawful for you. Means you can have all types of seafood, including it's mentioned in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 14, that the seafood, the flesh, you can have, which is tender and fresh. I start my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, which says, Hurramat alaykumul, maitutu waddamu, wa rahmul khinzir, wa ma uhinla li gairillah. That forbidden for you, for food, are huh? dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which the name of anyone besides Allah has been invoked. These four food are prohibited. Let's analyze each one of them. The first is dead meat. Science tells us today that if any animal dies of a disease or of old age, and if you have that meat, it is unhygienic for you. And there are chances you will acquire disease. And the verse continues that even the animal which has been strangled or which has been killed by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by going to death or which has been partially eaten by wild animals, all these are forbidden. We in Islam, before having an animal, it's compulsory that we do zabah. We sacrifice according to the Islamic law. That's the reason that we cut the jugular vein and the carotid artery, the food pipe and the windpipe while slaughtering. There was a Sikh brother, we have Sikhs in India who have the turbans, they come from the Punjab side. They believe in jhatka, in stunning death. So he was having an argument with a Muslim brother and he said, why do you all torture the animal? The way your Muslims cut, he bleeds to death and it is very painful. 
it is better to kill it in one stroke, just top of the head. So the Muslim brother, who, know, who was not well versed with science, he gave a very witty reply. He said, you are six, you are cowards, you are buzdil, you are attacked from behind. We Muslims, we are brave, we are courageous, we attack from the front. <laughs> anyway, this is not the reason why we do Zabah. The scientific reason that why we do Zabah is that during the sacrifice, according to the Islamic law, we have to take the name of Allah, as is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 6, verse number 121, that we have to take the number, name of Allah. And then we cut the carotid artery and the jugular vein, the windpipe and the food pipe. Now when we cut the, these vessels, the animal does not die on the spot. Whereas in the other style that is stunning to death or severing the head, the animal dies on the spot. In this method, people say it is more painful. Actually, it's the opposite. In stunning, the moment you give a blow on the head, the animal is stunned, but still it feels pain when it actually dies. In our method, the moment you severe the vessels, the blood supply to the nervous system is blocked. And thus, the animal cannot feel pain. It does struggle. That is due to the gushing forth of the blood from the vessels. The heart is yet functioning. The heart yet pumps the blood. And most of the blood in the body of the animal is flown out. And the second criteria which is forbidden is blood. And science tells us today that blood is a very good media for germ and bacteria as well as for disease. That's the reason when we do Zabah, most of the blood flows out and the meat that we have is more hygienic. And besides that, the meat which is sacrificed according to the Islamic law remains fresh for a longer time as compared to meat cut by stunning. The same was all the four categories, dead meat, blood, flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. These prohibitions have been repeated in no less than four different places in the Quran. Besides Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 3, it is also mentioned in Surah Bakra chapter number 2 verse number 173, in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145, and in Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115. The third category of prohibition is walahmil khinzir, the flesh of swine. If a Christian poses me the question, or a Jew, that why don't you have the flesh of swine, I will quote to him from his Bible. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the third book of the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, that the swine, it has parted hooves and cloven feet. It does not chew the cud. Its flesh is unclean. Thou shalt not have the flesh, neither shall you touch the carcass because it is unclean. So according to the Jewish law and the Christian law, they are not allowed to have the flesh of swine. This is also mentioned in Deuteronomy, chapter number 14. Similar thing about dead meat and blood is mentioned in the Bible. About the prohibition of dead meat is mentioned in Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 16 as well as in Deuteronomy chapter number 14. The prohibition of blood is mentioned in Leviticus chapter number 17, verse number 14, as well as in Deuteronomy chapter number 12. Let's analyze the scientific reasons of why Walahmil Khinzir, the flesh of swine, has been prohibited in Islam. The flesh of swine that is spoke, it harbors 17 different types of helmets. It has round worm, pin worm, hook worm, you name it, it's invariably there. The most dangerous of the lot is the tinea solium. In layman's term it's called as the tapeworm. It is several feet long. 
It is several feet long and harbors in the intestine. The ova of this tinea solium, the eggs, it travels through the bloodstream into almost all the organs of the body. If it enters the brain, it can cause severe brain damage, including loss of memory. If it enters the eye, it can cause blindness. If it enters the heart, it can cause heart attack. If it enters the lung, it can cause severe lung damage. It causes severe damage to various organs of the body. Another dangerous helminth is the Tuchinaris Tuchinaris, TT. But some people say that if we cook the pork very well, these helminths die. There was a research done in America that out of 24 people suffering from TT, 22 had cooked the pork very well. Science tells us today that the normal cooking temperature does not kill the ova of the helminths. It requires very high degree temperature which cannot be obtained under normal cooking temperature. The pork has got very little muscle building material. It has a lot of fat building material. That's the reason. The people who are pork eaters have got tires, have got flaps. The fat gets deposited into the walls of the vessel and causes arthrosclerosis, which leads to hypertension and heart attack. That's the reason that more than 50% of the Americans suffer from hypertension. The pig is one of the filthiest animals you can find on the face of the earth. It thrives on feces, muck and filth. In the villages of India, where we don't have the modern toilets like the one we have, the people go for the call of nature in the open air. And after they come back, the pig goes and clears it up. It's the best scavenger which I know that God has produced. It's the dirtiest animal. It is also one of the fil it is one of the most shameless animal on the face of the earth. It's the only animal which invites its friends to have sex with its mate, to have sex with its companion. Imagine. Therefore, there's a saying that if you eat pig, you behave like a pig. That's the reason that in the Western societies you have dance parties. And after the dance parties, you have swapping of wives. You sleep with my wife, I sleep with your wife. Do you think it's ethical? You eat pig and you behave like one. The fourth category, which is prohibited in that verse, is any food on which the name of anyone besides Allah has been invoked. For example, if you have prasad, which has with the name of any god besides Allah, like Ram or Krishna, has been taken, it is haram for you. Or, if you go to the church during communion, you have that, it's haram. The other prohibited category in this verse is that meat which has been obtained by rattling of the arrows or meat which has been sacrificed on the stone altars of the gods. All these are haram for a Muslim. There's another verse in the Quran from Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, which says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. O oh, you who believe, إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسُرُ Most certainly intoxicants and gambling. وَالْأَنزَابُ وَالْأَسْلَامُ Dedication of stones, divination of arrows, رُشْتُمْ مِنْ أَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَاحْتَنِبُوا لَلَّكُمْ تَفْلِهُونَ These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. The Quran says, all intoxicants are prohibited. I do not have to go into the details of the bad effects of the alcohol, which all of you may be knowing. It can damage almost all the organs of the body, including the heart, the brain, the eye, as well as liver, causing cirrhosis of the liver. It is associated with several diseases, including AIDS. Some people will say that, see, when we feel cold in the cold countries, what is the harm if we have a little bit beer? I 
tell them that why don't you sit close to the fire? It will keep you more warm than the alcohol. They say, no, we want to drink something. And I say, fine. Why don't you have honey? The honey you drink will keep you more warmer than the beer. But honey doesn't have that kick which the alcohol has. That's the reason they have beer. Today's doctors, they tell us that alcoholism is a disease. It's an ill person. The alcoholic, he's an ill person. Why do you want to trouble him? He's not addicted. He's a diseased person. If alcohol is a disease, it's the only disease that is sold in bottles. It's the only disease that is advertised in the newspapers, in the magazines, on TV, on radio. It's the only disease which has got a licensed outlet. It's the only disease which gives a revenue to the government. It's the only disease which has violent deaths on the highway. It's the only disease which has got no germ or bacteria as a cause. It's the only disease which ruins multiple families. The answer is given in the Quran. Rishtum min amali shaitan. It's not a disease. It's a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. This was in brief describing the unlawful food in Islam. But as a general outline, Quran says, Kulu tayyaban halalan. The food which is good and pure for you, it is halal for you. It's also mentioned in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 4 and 5. It says that all food which is lawful and good and pure for you, you are allowed to have it. In short, any food which is good, which suits you, is allowed for you. This is a broad outline. For example, if you are suffering from diabetes, sugar is bad for you. You should not have sugar. If you are suffering from hypertension, salt is bad for you. It is not tie up for you. It's not good for you, therefore abstain from it. <coughs> this was in short the scientific reasons of the dietary laws in Islam. On behalf of the congregation, Musallis of the Raza Juma Masjid, I would like to thank you for enlightening us. I do understand that a, uh, for a man with your knowledge to uh, to do justice to this subject, you may require much, much more time, and uh, on a Friday it is very difficult. Anyhow, may Allah reward you accordingly. Jazakallah. Brother Yusuf from the Daily News Milk Fund will be outside after Juma Salah. Kindly donate uh, generously towards the Milk Fund, which is uh, benefiting uh, the community daily. They are feeding, uh, uh, they are providing milk for hundreds of children on a daily basis. It is our Islamic duty. Kindly cooperate. Jazakallah. I'm sorry. Uh, those of you who would like to question uh, Dr. Zakir may do so after Juma Salah. If you have any uh, query on the issue which he has addressed on this topic, you are welcome to ask him a question and I'm sure he will be willing to answer you. Jazakallah. Uh, the frozen meat coming from Australia, is this halal for us to eat? Meat? And Australia and uh, crab. Crab. Yeah, crab. crab is not. Brother has posed two questions that any frozen meat that's coming from Australia, is it halal or not? If it has been in Zabia, if it's coming from a Muslim person who has taken the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cut it according to the Islamic law, as I mentioned in my lecture, it is halal. If it is not in Zabah, irrespective of whether it's frozen or not, it's haram for you. Any meat. Because it's sold in a Muslim shop now. We have the, Muslim economy. Okay, one more thing. Any food that is given by Muslim, according to a Sahih Hadith, it says that if a Muslim gives it to you, and if you don't know whether it's haram or halal, then the benefit of God goes to you. The sin will not come on you if you go on that Muslim brother. It's halal for you. But if you know specifically that that Muslim dealer is buying haram food, then if you know it, then you should avoid it. If you don't know, and if you're having food in a Muslim house, or buying food from a Muslim shop. And if you don't know it's haram or halal, it becomes halal for you, brother, according to a Sahih Hadith. Regarding the second part of the question of crab, there are some people 
who say that it is makruh, that it is not advised. But according to the Quranic ayat, as I quoted from you, as I quoted to you in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 96, as well as in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 14, it says, any seafood, the pursuit of it, the hunting of it, it's allowed. And its food is also allowed. As well as in Surah Nahal, it says that the flesh of the seafood, which is fresh and tender, it is halal for you. Now why it is halal, I could not explain in my lecture, because normally it is compulsory, they do zabia. But to a fish, how can it do zabah? And the blood will be there. So how come seafood is allowed? It's because normally the sea life, it can breathe underwater. But the moment it comes out of water, out of water, it cannot acquire the oxygen and it gasps for breath. When it does that, that sea life, the gills absorb the blood. So all the blood is absorbed by the gills of the fish. So the seafood that you have is free from blood. But natural, the gills is haram for you. But all seafood is allowed for you. Hope that answers the question. Uh, any other questions? Any brother may want to know? Question. Which fall in the category of carnivores. It eats other things. Other like carnivores are having teeth or claws. I didn't go into details. For example, anything which has claws and can have teeth, like lions from the cat family, lion, tiger, leopards, it's haram for you according to our beloved prophet. Though it's not mentioned in the Quran, but there's a verse in the Quran which says, according to Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 157, that whatever the prophet has made lawful for you, it's good for you. Whatever he has made haram for you, you should not have it. According to this, any say hadith which puts a prohibition on, any on anything, like for example carnivorous animals, you hope that answers the question. Uh, I think most of you will be wanting to go home as soon as possible now. One more thing yeah. actually, by, by the way, hand bill that frozen meat wasn't halal, but yes, the Muslim butchers are selling them. For our yeah. people. Who said so? It was in a hand bill. I read the hand bill. By who? No. Any handbill which is not in relation, which does not follow the laws of the Quran and the Hadith, it has got no base at all, irrespective of where I said it. Frozen food, suppose if it is not done zabah in the proper way, irrespective of whichever Maulana says, it is halal, it becomes haram, because Quran clearly mentions that any food on which the name of Allah has not been taken, as I mentioned in my talk in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 121, as long as whichever has not been done zabah, it's haram for you. So irrespective of whichever handle tells you, whichever book tells you, if it goes against the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, you should not follow it. So how would we know that it is halal? Now at least you know, brother, from today onwards, we don't have frozen food, we, should, we are not sure whether it's halal or not. Lots of people, people
Tower of the so what is going on here? Come to the commission, ask for you. Which is the first term? Allah, not the end of law. That the voice is done by Allah. What I wish to be that you associate the part of the same. What are you talking about the Baba that have Baba the Jordan law? And then be eager among ourselves. Lord, that pray for the law. By the Allah. And then they turn back. Fakulu Shadu, we are now the moon. Say, we are Muslims. Bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to come to come in terms as between us and them. The common term between all the major religions is that all religions believe that the God they worship is the same for the whole of humankind. The Christians believe that the God they worship is the same for the Christian as well as for the non-Christian. The Hindus believe that the God they worship is for the Hindus as well as the non-Hindus. <coughs> Similarly, few Muslims believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the worship is for the Muslims as well as for the non-Muslims. So let's analyze the concept of God in different religions. <coughs> First, coming to the According to Prophet Moses, he said in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4, Shema Israel, as my Allah, I know as my heart, that Jehovah is right, the God, our Lord, is one Lord. And he also said in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse number 89, that thou shalt not make any grave enemy of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, on the earth beneath, on the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, <laughs> not serve them. For the Lord, our God, is a jealous God. <coughs> so according to Judaism, we have to believe in one God and should not make images of God Almighty. If you read the Old Testament, you will understand religion in the proper context. Before I describe the concept of God Almighty in Christianity, I'd like to make a few points clear. That Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it not of faith to believe in Jesus may be his name. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus may be his name. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously, without any major intervention, which many modern Christians do not believe today. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born and blind and lepers with God's permission. We are going together, the Muslims and the Christians. But that is part of the <coughs> Many of the Christians believe that Jesus Christ will peace be upon him. He is God Almighty. He is God incarnate. <coughs> there is no single word in the whole Bible where Jesus Christ will peace be upon him. He himself says that I am God or worship me. In fact, he said in Matthew chapter number 5, was on the 17th. Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophet. I have come not to destroy but to fulfill. When one of the scribes asked him, Faith is the first of the commandments. Jesus Christ will peace upon him. He replied in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse number 29, that the first of all the commandments is, and he repeats verbatim what Musa had said, Shema Israelo, Allah ilai haino Allah ilai The Jehovah is right, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Same as Kul Hwallah Ahad, say is Allah one and only. <coughs> if you read the Bible, you will understand Christianity in the proper context. <coughs> If you ask a Hindu who does not know much about scripture, 
that how many God has believed in? Some may say three, some may say a hundred, some may say a thousand, while others may say thirty-three crores, three hundred and thirty million God. The belief in a thirty God as pantheism means everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the monkey is God, the snake is God. See Islam believes that everything is God. God is the apostle of death. Everything belongs to God. Meaning, the tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the monkey belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between Hinduism and Islam is the apostle of death. If we solve the difference, then the Muslim and Hindu will unite. If you want to understand Hinduism in the proper context, you have to read the Hindu scriptures. If you read the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, it mentions in chapter number 7, verse number 921, verse number 921, that all those who are in worship, all those who worship the God, they are materialistic people. Only materialistic people they do idol worship. The Vedas happen to be the most sacred of the scriptures of the Hindus. It's mentioned in Yajur Veda, chapter number 3, verse number 32. Nasta se Patima Asti, it's a Sanskrit quotation. Nasta se Patima Asti, of their God you cannot make any image. <coughs> It's the same as the Veda, chapter number 32, verse number 3. It says, God has got no image, he has got no body. Again, in the Veda, chapter number 40, verse number 8, it says, God is formless and bodiless. The next one, chapter number 40, verse number 9, says that all those who worship the Sambhuti, that is, the uncreated things like water, air, earth, all those who worship a samguti, they are endowed. And the world continues. Andhatma Vishanti, Ya Sambhuti Mupaste. Andhatma means darkness. Provishanti means entering. Sambhuti are the created things. They are more in darkness those who worship the created things. If you read the Hindu scriptures, it also says, Ekam Brahman, Dosya Naste, Niya Naste, Naste Kinchen. Ek hi Bhagawan hai, Sutra nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Bara bhi nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second God, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. If you pause the read the Hindu Veda, which happens to be the most sacred of all the four Vedas. It's mentioned in volume 2, chapter number 1, verse number 3 to 11, that God Almighty has got 33 different attributes. We in the Quran have got 99 different attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Rig Veda, volume 2, chapter 1, verse number 3 to 11 gives 33 different attributes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the attributes is Brahma, meaning the creator. If you translate that in Arabic, it means Khalid. We Muslims have got no objection in calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Khalid or the creator of Brahma. But if the Hindus say that Brahma is God Almighty, who has got three heads with three crowns on top, you are going against the Ayurveda. We do not accept the definition of God Almighty. Another attribute given the Rig Veda is Vishnu, meaning a sustainer, meaning rough. We Muslims have got no objection in calling God Almighty as rough, as sustainer, or Vishnu. But if you say Vishnu, the God Almighty, who's traveling on the bed of snakes, in the sea with 
beforehand, we have an objection. You are also going against the Rajul Veda, chapter 3, verse number 32. If you follow the reason of the Veda, it is mentioned in modern way, chapter number 1, verse number 1. Mark the Yadi Santa. All praises is due to him. Alhamdulillah. All praises is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, in the same way, Veda, order number 6, chapter number 46, verse number 16, says, Ya ik is mushtihi. There is only one God. Worship him alone. Kul wallah al. He is only one. So if you read, the Hindu scriptures, you will understand Hinduism in the proper context. <coughs> if you ask the Muslim, what is the definition of God Almighty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best answer he can give you is from Surah Ra, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul wallahu al-Ahad, say he's Allah one and only. <coughs> Allah is the Allah is absolutely done. Lam ilay baramula. He forgets not, nor is forgotten. Wala wa kulla wa kukpa al-ahad. And there is nothing unto him like in this world. This is a four-line definition given in the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you read the Quran, in the Quran there are 99 attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like Rahman, Rahim, Karim, Malik, Kudus, etc. And the grounding one is Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Kurdullah, on the Rahman, Ayyamah Tarku, follow Asma al Hasna. Say, call upon Allah, or call upon Rahman. To him belongs all the beautiful names. Call him by any name. To him belongs the most beautiful name. So we have got no objection as long as the name is beautiful and it does not conjure up a mental picture. But being Muslim, give a crowning name as Allah. Why do we prefer calling God Almighty as Allah instead of the English word God? Because the Arabic word Allah is a pure word. It cannot be played around with. For example, the word God. If you add S to God, it becomes God. Plural God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Allah is only one. You can't make a plural of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you add P C S S to God, it becomes Goddess. A female God. There's nothing like female Allah and male Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got no gender. If you add a father to God, it becomes a Godfather. If he is a guardian, there is nothing like Allah Abba. You can't add a father to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. Again, God in the English language can be spelled with a small d and a capital D. <coughs> Capital G is God Almighty. Small G means a fake God. In Islam, there is nothing like capital Alif and small Alif. Allah is unique. If you add sin to God, it becomes a sin God. It's a fake God. There is nothing like sin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims prefer calling God Almighty by the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you analyze and ask a normal person, what does he mean by the word religion? He will say it is a code of ritual. In that context, Islam is not a mere religion. It is a deed, a complete way of life, a complete code of life, as mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 3. Verse number 19. In the Sina in the Islam, the only religion acceptable 
there's no relative who she cannot marry is given. Besides these people, she should wear the Islamic parda, the Islamic hijab. If every person, every individual in this world follow the Islamic hijab, <coughs> will the crime increase, will it decrease, or will it remain the same? Yeah. I'd like to give you an example. Let's suppose two beautiful twin sisters, they are walking down the road. Both are equally beautiful. One wears the Islamic hijab, completely covered, and the other wears the western clothes of a mini or a shot. And if they are walking together, and there is a ruffian, there is a hooligan, waiting round the corner to see the girl, which one will he tease? Will he tease the girl in the Islamic hijab or the girl wearing short or mini? But natural, he will tease the girl wearing short and mini. Even after Islam has given you the broad outline of the dress code and lowered your gaze, in spite of that, if anyone commits a rape, what solution does Islam have for that? <laughs> Islam says that you should chop off the head of the rapist. That's the punishment. Non Muslim says it's a barbaric law. Today, in America, on an average, 1,900 women are being raped every day. On an average, every 1.3 minutes, one rape is being committed. Last week, I attended the conference of the Indian Medical Association, and there, one of the speakers said that in this country of South Africa, every minute, one rape is committed. I want to ask you the question that if you apply the Islamic Sharia, will this rate of crime increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? <laughs> but naturally it will decrease. The Quran says that when you speak with everyone, non-Muslim or Muslim, follow the guy who's given his friend ahead, chapter number 16, verse number 125. <laughs> Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom. For more with them hasna and beautiful preaching. What are they who build at the Ahsan? And argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best in the creation. Bhakti Dawana and Kundalini Lakshmi.